This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries. Welcome to Jesus the Healer. We're so glad you're with us today. And we invite you that as you watch the broadcast, expect to receive something. Yes. Expect God to speak to you. Expect answers. Expect help for your life. And uh, we invite you to get your Bible. Get a notepad, get a pen, follow along with us. For some time now, we've just been going through the different healings that happened under Jesus' earthly ministry, and we're studying those. Why? Because contained in those is everything we need to know about how to receive healing and also how to minister healing. Yes. Listen, God wants us skillful in His Word, skillful at receiving, but also skillful at ministering it to others. And you say, well, Pastor Nancy, I don't have a ministry. Everyone is, has a ministry of reconciliation. Everyone, what is the ministry of reconciliation? Telling them that God is holding nothing against them, that God has made everything for their life available to them, salvation, deliverance, peace, joy, everything they need. And that is your privilege to get to share that. Also, the word says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He wasn't talking to preachers in the book of James. He wasn't talking to preachers when he said that. He was talking to you who the greater one is on the inside of you. And so you need to know how to minister healing to someone as well as how to receive it for yourself. So that's why we're taking time to especially study these line by line, these passages of healings that happened under Jesus's earthly ministry. We're taking the time to do it and we want, we're so glad you're taking the time to join us in doing it. So today, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter four, and we're going to read starting in verse 46. John chapter four, verse 46, and we'll read all the way through verse 54. It says, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought Jesus that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when his son began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So let's back up. Let's examine these verses in detail. I want us to go to verses 46 and 47 again. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So this tells us that this is the second miracle that Jesus did in Galilee. The first miracle was when Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding. You'll remember that. So this man had faith enough to ask him to come and minister to his son. Evidently, he had heard about the first miracle. Possibly he could have been present at that wedding. 
where that happened, we don't know. But we know this, he heard something about Jesus. Yeah. That's why he came to him that his son was at the point of death and they were uh, in a very serious condition. Mm -hmm. yes. And he said, would you come and come to my house and minister to him? So we can assume also that the son is a younger in age mm -hmm. because he is still under the authority of his father. You know, as our children are younger, our faith will work for them. Yes. When you have children that are young and they have a need, you can pray for them and God will answer your faith. But as your children go, mm -hmm. God expects more of them in their own faith life mm -hmm. that they develop their own faith life. And so God will expect and require more of them. I've taught my children. I have two sons that are one is 35 years old and one is 27, 26 I don't know. I don't know how old he is. <laughs> and um, he, is, he is 26, yes. He is 26, thank you. But if they have a need right now, what I do is when they tell me about a need, I say, this is how you need to pray. Amen. This is what you need to believe. Amen. I put the believing back on them because I don't want to turn them spiritually reliant on me as adults. And God wants us all to have our own faith. But as children are young, God allows your faith to work in their behalf. So as parents, we do our set where we do a disservice to our children, expecting that we can carry them on our own faith for years and years and years. We cannot. We, as we're learning, we should be training them also. So we can assume that this young man is under, he's, he's under age, so to speak, because his father's faith, Jesus is allowing his father's faith to work in his behalf. And so in verse 48, it says, Then said Jesus unto him, talking to this nobleman, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So this statement is showing us that evidently that the nobleman lacks an absolute faith. What is his faith in? You coming to my house. You ministering to my son. But verse 49 the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So his faith originally was resting on Jesus coming to his house. If we're not careful, we can set our faith on something other than the word. He was... He was putting his faith on him, on Jesus coming to his house. Like, I need to see you come in. I need to see you touch my son. I need to hear you pray for him. Well, Jesus uh, met him, but then elevated his faith. He brought his faith up. Jesus didn't go to his house. <laughs> Why? Because he's going to bring this man to another level of believing. Jesus didn't go anywhere near his son. Jesus didn't lay hands on him. Jesus didn't pray for him. So he didn't do anything that the man asked. Why? Because he recognized this man's faith is able to come up. It's able to come up and I'm going to put a demand on his faith that it comes up. Instead, instead of going to his house, instead of laying hands on him, instead of praying for him, what did he do? Jesus spoke words. He gave words to the man for him to believe. It's one thing to believe because Jesus comes to your house. It's another thing to believe because he said something to you. It's a whole nother level of faith. So Jesus put a greater demand on his faith. He was to believe his son was healed for one reason, because Jesus said so. Just because Jesus said so. So we see this. The nobleman chose to believe it. He chose to believe that his son could be healed even if Jesus didn't come to his house. He chose to believe 
that even if Jesus didn't lay his hand on his son, that his son could still be healed. Yeah. He chose to believe that yeah. even if he never heard Jesus pray a prayer for his son, yeah. that he could still be healed. So what did he do? This man took Jesus at his word. This is the kind of faith that pleases God. The kind of faith that just takes him absolutely at his word without any proof, without any evidence, without anything changing. You just believe what he said and you resume living. So believing is a choice. It's not a feeling. Many people want to feel something spiritual before they believe God heard them or before before they believe God is working with them. But we have to choose to believe apart from what we feel, apart from what we see, because believing is a choice. It is not a feeling. And you can choose to believe the right thing when you're feeling everything that's wrong. When you're seeing everything that's wrong in the face of that, you can still choose to believe. And this is what is so wonderful about this nobleman. He had faith to come, but he had a limited expectation. He expected his son could be healed if Jesus showed up in his house, if he touched him and if he prayed. And Jesus said, I don't want to leave your faith at that level. Let's bring you up to believing this, believing words, believing words. So he believed Jesus' words and he went his way. He walked off as though it was done. Now think about it. His son is at the point of death. It took faith for him to turn around and walk off and say his words are enough. He didn't approach Jesus that way, but once being around Jesus and listening to him, he left Jesus that way. Amen. He left that scene believing that Jesus' words were enough for his dying son. What's this show us is God has more than one way, more than one method of meeting our needs. And he wants to use the method for us that will put, that will bring us to the highest level of faith. He wants to bring us to a place of greater faith than we had before the need showed up. So Jesus is going to lead us and God is going to lead us and the Holy Ghost is going to lead us based on what's best for our faith. This man could easily believe that his son would be healed if Jesus showed up. But Jesus said, Let's take your faith up to another level and let's just put a different demand on your faith. Amen. And so Jesus told him, go thy way, thy son liveth. So the nobleman believed words. He didn't believe what he saw. He didn't see Jesus come to his house. He didn't believe what he heard in the sense of he didn't hear Jesus pray a prayer for his son. Jesus just spoke words, says, go your way. So he said, go thy way, thy son liveth. I love this phrase that Jesus gives this man. Can you imagine how preoccupied this nobleman has been in concern? His son is at the point of death. Can you imagine how that would occupy your attention? Sure it would. It would draw on you in such a difficult way and Jesus said to him go thy way what's that mean resume living resume living just go your way continue your life so many people stop what they're doing for God because they're entrenched in a need and real faith just it does it just acts like I win. I'm not going to put my life on hold. I'm not stopping moving forward in the plan of God. I'm going to keep going my way. As long as your way is a righteous way <laughs> and in line with what's pleasing to God. And so he basically tells the man, go your way, go on home, resume your life. 
That took faith when the last thing he knew about his son was his son was dying. It took faith for him to, hey, I can resume my living. I don't have to stop everything in my life to give attention to the, the challenge that's facing me. That doesn't mean when he says go your way, it doesn't mean don't do anything. Go your way in faith. What way? Yes. He's going yes. the faith way. Yes. Go yes. thy way. It is the faith way. He is going believing words. He is going believing that his son's condition has been changed. He's expecting something. So he's going the way of faith when he goes his way and resumes his living. Go thy way, thy son liveth. So I don't know how far this journey was, but my guess is this. Jesus gave him something to think about on his way. Go thy way. He told him, go, go thy way. So he starts traveling home, but he gives him something to know, something to meditate on during that journey because in a time like this, don't you know the devil would love to harass him? You didn't bring the prophet. He's not coming to your house. He, you're not, he's not going to lay hands on your son. He's not going to pray for him. But Jesus gave the man something to meditate on on his journey home. Thy son liveth. Thy son liveth. Thy son liveth. So these are the words he gave him to hold to while he's returning on his way of faith. Your son lives. Your son. You can know he's thinking that over and over, saying it, meditating on it. Why? Because if he doesn't, the devil will harass the mind. This is what you have to know when you're faced with a need. The devil would love to torment you with your need. Know what the word says. Know what the word says and resume your living on the way of faith. Go thy way. Go the way of faith. And as you're going the way of faith, meditate on what the word says. Meditate on the instructions given you in the word. Those are that's your peace. That's your joy. So faith doesn't just sit and watch and wait to see if the word works. Faith believes something. Jesus gave the man something to believe. He's believing that his son lives. And he's believing that with every step that he's making toward his home. He gives faith, believes and speaks the word. It acts like the word is true. It resumes living on the path of faith. Amen. Verses 51 and 52. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Ah, isn't that exactly what Jesus said? Thy son liveth. So he's, he's replaying these words over and over. You know that it's, it's given, that's what he's holding to with every step. And because he is, when he arrives, there's the evidence of what Jesus said to him. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when his son began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So we know this man has spent overnight in his journey. Yes. He stopped somewhere to rest. He stopped somewhere to sleep. When he's going to bed, he's not thinking in a situation like this, you can't be thinking yes. of how the son is dying. You had to be thinking of what the word says. Yes. He's, he lives. He lives. I can sleep peacefully. He lives. Amen. And it says that uh, he asked of them the hour when he began to amend. So notice this. Even this miracle shows us that it, ha it was a process yes. over time. This healing was a process. The first thing that happened that they could measure was the fever left him. We don't know if it, this was an infection. We don't know what it was. But we know this, that fever was one of the symptoms of his condition. And it was a symptom that they could measure. Yes. It was a symptom that they could tell themselves whether it was there or not. Right. So we know the first thing that they could measure was that the fever left. So we can assume that the process, of course, continued. Yes. 
the process of healing. So he began to amend. This is a case of gradual healing, not instantaneous healing. Although it's gradual, it's still divine. Although it's gradual, it is still supernatural. And this is what happens. Many will limit God because they are looking for the instantaneous and they limit God and will only believe if something happens instantaneously. And if it's not instantaneous, then they let go of their faith or they drop their believing. They set it aside because something wasn't instantaneous. Mm -hmm. This healing was not instantaneous. It was a process. And that was a result of Jesus's ministry. Not everyone was healed instantaneously. He began to amend how my, I would say this, that he amended that the, 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 the mending process was going on as the man was continuing to hold to what Jesus said. My son liveth, my son liveth, my son liveth. And by him believing the right thing and going home, then the healing process could continue. If he's going to stop believing, the healing process will stop. But as he continues to believe, the process will continue. So this is where many miss it. They limit God to the instantaneous and they miss the supernatural. This process was still supernatural, no matter how gradual. So it's wrong thinking to limit God to instantaneous because people assume everything God does is instantaneous. This isn't true in this case. It was not instantaneous. Now, it, it my the, it's not due to Jesus's faith. It's due to the man's faith. Amen. And the enemy will take advantage of any wrong thinking and cause doubts to arise. Now, if someone thinks I'm only healed if it if it shows up instantaneously, that's wrong thinking. And the devil will take advantage of that to cause them to doubt. And if we doubt, we let go of our faith and we don't receive the miracle that could have been ours, the healing that could have been ours. Amen. Amen. So Mark 16, and I'll just quote it to you real quick. Mark 16 and verse 18 says, lay hands on the sick and they shall what? Recover. That's a process. It, that doesn't say they'll instantaneously be healed. It says they will recover. Sometimes that recovery process can happen in a moment of time. Sometimes that recovery process can happen over days, weeks, maybe even months. But if we just continue to believe, the process continues. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Don't be so concerned about how long it takes. Our job is to make sure we're believing. That's our job. Amen. It's God's job to make sure that it manifests. It's our job to just keep believing. Just be occupied with, am I believing? Amen. Well, how do you know if you're believing? If you're thanking God for it. Father, I thank you that I'm healed. I thank you that all the pain is gone from my body. I thank you that my body is functioning whole as it ought to. Amen. So one evangelist told the story years ago how he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. And this would have been probably around in the 1930s. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis. And of course, that was a death sentence in those days. And so this young evangelist, every church that he went to, he would ask the congregation, would you please pray for me? Every time you think of me, would you pray for me? And so he went to many congregations over the course of a year. So many in those congregations, of course, said, yes, we'll pray for you. So he declines and goes down further and further and further physically. And as he's laying there basically on his deathbed dying, He's now at his in-laws home. His, his wife's parents have taken them in and allowed them to live with them. And he's laying on his deathbed and he begins to think, he thinks, well, if it was prayer that I would have needed, then I would have been healed by now because hundreds and hundreds have agreed to pray for me. But he says, but I'm still not healed. So it must not mean that it's prayer that I need. It must mean that I just need to take God at his word. So he said to God, he said, I'm just going to take you at, at your word and I'm going to quit praying 
for you to do something and just take you at your word. This is what this man did. He took Jesus at his word. He didn't continue to stay there and ask and ask and ask and ask something of Jesus. He just continued on, went on his way home. So this young minister who recognized it's not prayer I need, I just need to take God at his word and believe that he has paid the price for my healing. So he goes outside. He crawls actually outside because he, he loved a certain region of the yard. And so he was going to just go out there and he says, I'm going to go out there and just praise God for my healing. And he crawled out there and his lungs were so weakened from the tuberculosis that he could not be heard above a whisper. And he just lays there on the ground. It took all of his strength to even get there where he was at. And he's laying there and he's whispering, thank you that I'm healed. Thank you for healing. I believe your word that you took my infirmities and you bear my sicknesses. I'm going to quit praying for that. And I'm going to just believe that it's true. And he just began to praise and praise and praise. He said when he first started, he could only lift his voice at a whisper. He said by the end of one hour, he is standing on his feet and shouting so loud they could hear him all the way down the road. Why? Because he, he, it, the healing process was not instantaneous, but he began to amend at the time he believed the word that was spoken instead of waiting to see something to believe, instead of waiting to feel something to believe, he believed at the word. And when he believed at the word, that word started doing a work in him. So I say to you who need something from God, just go on your way. Believe you receive. Believe the word. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to figure out when. Quit trying to figure out how. That's none of our part. God's part is the how. God's part is the power. Our part is the believing. And the believing is easy. All we have to do is say, I believe I receive. I believe I receive. I believe I receive. I believe I receive. And you say, well, I said that before. This man obviously said it all the way home. Hour after hour. This man believed it all the way home. It doesn't matter how long we have to say it. It matters how bad do you want it. I want it bad enough to keep believing it. Just keep believing. Just keep believing. I said, just keep believing. Go on your way. Resume living. Go on the way of faith. Get up and continue your living. Continue your believing. Continue your saying. And don't let opposition stop you in your progress. Move forward in faith. Hallelujah. 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 We trust you've enjoyed today's program. Visit us at DufresneMinistries.org to learn of our upcoming meetings, share your testimony, submit a prayer request, or visit our online store. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries.